Good morning. Good morning. We're going to begin our service. I think. Welcome to you on this uh, Valentine's morning, but more importantly, this Lord's Day morning. Um, the giver of love, the creator of love, the one whom we love most. But um, we pray that you'll have a wonderful day. We'll have a wonderful morning of celebrating the Lord and worshiping the Lord together. I hope you look forward to this every week. This is just a, a special time to, to be with you. I mean, praying for you and working and ministering on behalf of you and alongside of you. And just to have us together every week is, is a wonderful thing. And Brad, welcome. And if you haven't met Brad yet, be, before you leave this building, please meet Brad. Um, and also, I want to say Gail and Gary have been with us for I don't know how many weeks. You're part of the family. Uh, this is their last Sunday until they return whenever. See, I'm setting you up. Um, they're on their way to El Paso, and um, they'll be sure and greet them. And it, we, we're having, I don't, don't want to get ahead of the announcements. Um, okay, the next announcement is we're having a shared meal right after this service. So if any of you can stay, Please do. If you didn't bring anything, I'm sure that's fine. We usually have a lot of food, and it's a great time to get to know one another better and to just fellowship together around the table. Also, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're continuing with our series on 1 John. Tonight, 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. I've titled it The Essential Role of Spiritual Parents. Um, John writes to spiritual fathers, spiritual children, spiritual young men, and we're going to see what he means by that. And it's a very um, interesting and important portion of scripture with regard to spiritual parenthood. Um, also, I want to convey to you Dan and Joni Babcock's greetings. Not all of you know Dan and Joni. They are usually winter visitors from Canada. They haven't been able to come this year because of the COVID thing. The restrictions there are really, really restrictive. In fact, a pastor in their own province was jailed this week for holding services. Uh, continue to pray for all of the churches, all of the Christian churches, because especially in the United States and Canada even more so, it's getting harder and it's getting harder just to keep the doors open. And so continue to pray. We have this privilege now. We could lose it, uh, or we could just, you know, say, you know, we're going to meet anyway and then see what the legal system eventually does. And that's what this pastor and other pastors uh, in, in uh, Canada have done and are facing some consequences. So uh, be in prayer, please. And in part of that prayer, be thankful for the fact that we can come together in this way. Sky is with us again this week. Sky, where are you? There he is. Sky is a traveling evangelist, but he's also looking for work. So he asked me to announce if any of you have any pickup kind of work or full time work uh, that you might offer him, just talk to him afterwards. Sky is right here. So those are all of the announcements. So I do invite you, please, to stand. We're going to sing together. It is hymn number 31, Love Divine. We'll sing all verses, and then please remain standing for the reading of God's word.
one of my favorite <coughs> hymn lines, Lost in Wonder, Love, and Praise, that aptly describes what it awaits us in heaven, in the presence of God the Father, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all the angels, and all the saints, and I'm kind of eager. Uh, you might get a sense of that, but um, not yet. I'm reading from 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, a very familiar portion of scripture to most of us, 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know, <coughs> excuse me, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son into the world to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected in us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Please bow with me. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, we bow before you because we love you, because we've gathered to express that love to you through our prayers and through our praise, through our songs, through being attentive to your word, through the fellowship that we enjoy in this kind of a setting. Father, I thank you that we have the opportunity to be together today. We do pray for all of your churches worldwide who are under various levels of persecution. Uh, some pastors and others who have been jailed because of their testimony for you. Father, we pray for your protection over them. We pray for your wisdom and discernment to permeate their minds, their hearts, their congregations, their families. I pray that for us as well. Lord, the challenges are, are increasing. The challenges can be great. We want to face them with love and with discernment and with the principles and power and authority of your word. So we ask that you would teach us today to be more like Jesus Christ, who suffered on our behalf. And Lord Jesus, thank you, not only for your suffering, but for your intercession for us, your daily ministry to us by your spirit, the promises that you've given to glorify all of those who trust in you. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of repentance. Thank you for the gift of worship, which we offer to you in your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Hymn number 519, Love Lifted Me When Nothing Else Could Help, Love Did It. Well, that's not what the songwriter said, but that's how I just interpreted his song. Love Lifted Me. Let's sing it together, all three verses. Save 
theme going with the <coughs> this morning, and this will continue as well. Even though maybe the world would focus on loving one another, which is good, these songs focus on the love of our Lord and Savior directed towards us, and in response, our love directed back towards us. This one here is an old hymn, should be familiar, plays with a more uh, modern tune. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Yeah. 
<coughs> Barb and I will share with you another hymn <coughs> called Love Will Win. Thank you, Rick and Barb. Appreciate that very much. And it gives um, a fuller expression to John 3.16, doesn't it? For God so loved you and me, the world, that he gave his only precious begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's, it's true. Love was when God became a man in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the fullest, most complete expression of his love. And then I really believe the fullest and most complete expression of our Lord's love was submitting to the Father, going to the cross, and uh, making payment so that we might be redeemed. Um, and that, of course, prompts our great, unending, eternal love for him. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. We are continuing in our ongoing study of the book of Acts. While you're turning there, let me just mention, and I should have mentioned this earlier, and I, I uh, forgive me for not doing it. We have people, uh, namely John and Eva Holman and Dennis Lamazny, who are out in treacherous weather driving big rigs. And I know there are many, many, many more, and people you may know, but... As part of our family, please be in prayer for them, for their safety. This is Dennis's first week of driving. He's in Portland, Oregon today, 
and he's had a really challenging week. And the weather has been a major factor in that. And John and Eva Holman are battling an ice storm, or at least the, the remnants of an ice storm somewhere in Texas, no, New, uh, New Mexico. John was hoping to be here this morning, and he's not here. And, and incidentally, Jerry, thank you for covering for John in the booth this morning. And John and Eva, we love you, we miss you. Dennis, we love you too, and miss you. They may see this later on, so I wanted to be sure and let them know that we are praying for them. Acts chapter 21, we're actually, in a sense, on the home stretch. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, so after I don't know how long uh, in the book of Acts, we've taken our time, or at least I've taken my time, because there is so much here, and I wanted us to be able to see it, how God um, fed and grew the church and all that was taking place, especially in the life of Paul, this um, remarkable man whom God did such a profound work in his life from one who hated Christians, who hated Jesus Christ, who thought he was serving God by persecuting and even murdering some Christians. And incidentally, Paul not, never got over that. He always saw himself as the least of the apostles. He always saw himself as the greatest of sinners. And, and that was because he understood because of the Holy Spirit and because of the, the Lord's work in him and presence in his life, he understood what, a, what a, a tremendous violation, a horrendous violation it was for him to go after God's people, and yet God forgave him. And that's a great testimony for us, because, and I've met many people, and you probably have too, who, who feel that, well, I'm just too sinful uh, for God to forgive me. And of course, my question is, well, how many Christians have you killed lately? Have you heard about Paul? You know, I, and I don't say it flippantly, but the point is, God's grace is greater than our sin. The hymn writer says it, more importantly, Scripture says that. And we serve a loving and a forgiving God. And, and aren't you glad? Because we need ongoing cleansing, we need ongoing forgiveness, we need that ongoing intercession that our Lord Jesus Christ brings into our lives. But we're at Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 14 is our specific text for today. Before we actually open that text, I want to pray once again and ask the Lord to do his will in our lives through this text as we go through it together. So please bow with me. Father, it is our desire this morning, as you know, to honor you by coming to your word, by listening carefully to what you are teaching us through Paul's experience, through the things that you allowed into his life, even the persecution of the joys, all of it. He is such a great model of what it means to be persevering in the faith, what it means to set you and the gospel before anything in this temporal life. Lord, help us to learn from him and help us to apply it in our own lives as we face the challenges that you permit us to face for our own growth, but primarily for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 20... And not all of you were here last week uh, when we concluded chapter 20. But in chapter 20, it ended with Paul meeting with the elders from the church at Ephesus. That was a key meeting. And we had two messages from that portion of Scripture because Paul shared with those, actually he didn't share, he challenged them, with what I titled non-negotiables for spiritual leadership. And they apply more specifically to me and to Rick and those who are in spiritual leadership. But generally, they apply to all believers. I just want to list them for you because these are essential. This is the fabric. This is the skeletal structure that gives strength and credibility to spiritual leadership and to our Christian testimonies as well as we continue to grow in Christ. Personal integrity, discipleship, servant leadership, pure motives, a sacrificial and generous heart, exalting God's word, submitting to God's will, guarding the flock, relying on God, and fervent prayer. And we could add more, but those are the ones that Paul highlighted. And he, he had a very brief time with these leaders, and he knew he wouldn't see them again. So these were very central in Paul's thinking, and of course should be central in our thinking too, as we grow in Christ and as we evaluate, as we evaluate our own Christian lives these are things that we need to give serious consideration to. But now in this morning's passage, that meeting has ended. 
and Paul, along with Luke and some other companions, are beginning the trip back to Jerusalem. And when they re- get back to Jerusalem, that will end Paul's third missionary journey. That's what he's on now, the, the third missionary journey. Central to this passage, this is a central feature, so I want to point this out to you before we even read the passage. Central feature of this passage is the role of special revelation. And when we say revelation, we mean God revealing himself. God has revealed himself in Scripture. But as Scripture was being written, as Scripture was historically unfolding, God revealed himself, uh, the book of Hebrews tells us, in the Old Testament, through the prophets and through the fathers, and now through Jesus Christ, and now through the apostles, through the writing of God's word, God revealing himself. That revelation is a central focus in the passage that we're going to read in just a few minutes. This passage speaks in verse 4, The Spirit spoke through the disciples at the city of Tyre, warning Paul of the dangers dangers that he was going to face once he got to Jerusalem. In verse 9, we'll see that Philip, the evangelist, had four daughters who were prophetesses. They prophesied. We'll, We'll look just briefly at what that means in case you're not familiar with it. In verses 10 and 11, 11, will be reintroduced to the prophet Agabus. The first time we met him was back in Acts chapter 11, where he prophesied of a great famine that was to come. Here in this text, Agabus will use an object lesson, interestingly, to illustrate once again the persecution and the imprisonment that awaits Paul in Jerusalem. Now, given the importance of prophecy in this passage and throughout the New Testament, I thought it would be good to take a a brief amount of time to give you a brief overview of the office of a New Testament uh, prophet and the gift of New Testament prophecy. And this will be just a cursory overview. It's kind of a double lesson this morning. I've entitled this, Paul's Travel to Jerusalem, subtitled, When Godly Determination Rejects Personal Safety. Because that's what we're seeing in Paul. He was so determined. And he was so driven by his love for the Lord and the Holy Spirit and his duty toward the gospel and toward his disciples, nothing, even the threat of death itself, could stop him or did stop him. And we'll see as we go through this some of the frustration that those who loved him went through trying to stop him from getting to Jerusalem. Don't go there. The Holy Spirit has revealed that you're going to be imprisoned. You're going to be taken before the Gentiles. Eventually, you're going to die. Don't go there. And Paul said, well, why are you doing this to me? You're breaking my heart. I'm going to go even if it means I die. Now, I've just given you kind of a, the end. I'm, I'm a spoiler that way. That, that's, that's the end. Those are the final verses, but we haven't gotten there yet. But as far as a, a New Testament prophet, let me give you an overview. They were people specifically gifted, and they were men and women. We see two of them here in in the prophetesses uh, that were Philip's daughters. They were specifically gifted men and women who sometimes spoke New Testament revelation or new revelation from God. They often reiterated previous revelation that had been given either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, but they always spoke under divine prompting. This wasn't of their own creation. It was God revealing through them and prompting them very specifically. Therefore, when they spoke, what they spoke was always infallible. That means incapable of error. It was always authoritative because it was from God himself, and it was always accurate. In fact, the acid test of a biblical prophet, Old Testament and New Testament, was always 100% accuracy when they were prophesying something to come. And they always directed their hearers to the true God. In fact, in Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18, if you want to look at those up later on, the, God gives the, those tests for Old Testament prophets. And those who failed that test, who said, God has told me this and I'm giving it to you, they were to die. I mean, God took this very, very seriously. We don't do that in the New Testament or today. But he still takes it just as seriously when people say, I'm speaking in the name of the Lord and the Lord hasn't spoken to them. Now, I emphasize all of that because those who claim today, and there are many who claim to be prophets today, there are many who claim to prophesy. 
The prophets today are not of that caliber, and their supposed prophecies are often incorrect. I don't want to dwell on that point, but I do want you to know, and it's important that if you're not aware, contemporary prophets, and I use that in quotes, even acknowledge that their prophecies aren't equal with biblical standards. They understand that. I'll give you just one illustration. This is from Arnold Bittlinger in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, and he says this, and I quote, The wonderful and yet mysterious thing about prophecy is that the Holy Spirit in all his perfection combines with the human spirit in all its imperfection. One consequence of this in our era and due to our weakness is the fact that our prophesying is imperfect. It is also obvious that the value and purity of our prophecy is conditioned by the state of the human channel, close quote. That's, that's typical of contemporary prophets, and again, I use that in quotes. However, biblically, true prophecy was always accurate. It was never corrupted by the human channel. God conveyed his message through godly prophets, through reluctant prophets like Jonah. He even conveyed it through an evil high priest like Caiaphas. The channel was incidental. The channel never corrupted God's message. The prophets always spoke, again, authoritatively, infallibly, accurately. That has to be the standard. We cannot, we must not accept anything less than that and anything that claims to be from God. Inaccurate or impure prophecy is no biblical prophecy at all. Now, having said that, come back to the overview of New Testament prophets. And incidentally, if that raises some questions you want to ask me, be sure and ask me afterwards or sometime when it's convenient. I'll be glad to explore that with you if necessary. But when we're talking now about New Testament prophets, New Testament prophets were most often connected with local churches, not with the broad ministry such as the apostles had. Excuse me. In our passage for this morning, Agabus and the daughters of Philip are examples of a prophet and two prophetesses. Agabus being a prophet who prophesied beyond his local community. He was from Judea, and now he was coming to where Paul is in Tyre. And the, it's likely, although Scripture doesn't specifically say, but it's likely that the daughters of Philip prophesied in a local venue as well. We, we don't know that because nothing else is known about them except that they were prophetesses. But that clearly tells us that they were godly women uh, chosen by God for a special prophetic office. Now, the gift of New Testament prophecy as over against the office of a prophet The gift of New Testament prophecy is a gift that was given to the church by the Holy Spirit through which the Holy Spirit communicated, this is important, prior to the completion of Scripture. There There were many years in the apostolic era where Scripture was being formulated. And God would speak, we see this in 1 Corinthians, that's early on, one of the first books, maybe the first book that Paul wrote, Um, Early in the ministry, early in the life of the church, God was communicating quite often through the gift of prophecy, and it had to be governed. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul gives some governing principles by that. By the end of his life, when he wrote to Timothy and to Titus, nothing is mentioned about prophets, nothing is mentioned about prophecy, and those books, we call them the pastoral epistles, say nothing about leadership uh, evaluating prophecy Uh, prophesying, being a prophet, it's just not there. So by the time Paul ended, and I'll show you from Scripture, by the time certainly that the book of Revelation was written, prophecy had ceased by God's command. And I'll show you that, at least very briefly I'll show you that. In fact, it's Revelation chapter 22. I'll read this as an example. But first, let me tell you this. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. When we talk about prophecy, the, the word prophecy literally means to speak before. In some contexts of Scripture, it is to speak before an event. In other words, foretelling what will happen. In other portions of Scripture, the prophet is speaking before an audience. In other words, foretelling, if we can put it that way. One is preaching, one is prophesying that something will happen or predicting And those are both aspects of the word itself, prophecy, translated in the English prophecy. 
So the context, the setting in which the word is used will determine how it's being used and what is occurring. Now, having said that, looking at Revelation 22, we'll put it on the overhead. You needn't turn to it. You can if you want to, though. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, this is Jesus. This is closing the book of the Revelation. Jesus says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. This is a serious thing. Again, how God views prophecy. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. At that time, false teachers and false prophets were a major problem. And this is the time when John was writing, actually during the whole New Testament era. Um, but it's certainly by the time he wrote the Revelation. And just as they are today, they were a problem then. Therefore, Jesus warned everybody who hears the book not to add or subtract to it. Now, that warning very specifically applies to the book of Revelation. It's copying, and it would be copied, and the Lord knew that it would be copied. We don't have any of the original manuscripts, so thankfully it was copied, and it was to be copied precisely. But it also applies to the teaching of the book not adding anything to it, none of the counterfeit revelations that circulated through false teachers, false prophets in the name of the apostles. That would have added error or would have subtracted truth to the text. Now, I want to quote Dr. Robert Thomas, and you probably don't know who he is, but um, he's, uh, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, incidentally, he's, he's with the Lord now, but he was one of my professors at the Master's Seminary and at Talbot Seminary, um, highly regarded as an exegete, as an expositor of Scripture. But I'm quoting him here. The commands here, that is what John just said in these two verses, terminate any further prophecies that might arise through other prophets or, prophes or prophetesses. Further, he says, the predictive portions of Revelation project from John's lifetime all the way to the eternal state. Therefore, any type of prophetic utterance would intrude into the domain of this coverage and constitute either an addition or a subtraction from Revelation's context. So the final book of the Bible is also the concluding product of New Testament prophecy, close quote. In other words, prophecy, the prophetic office, and prophecy itself ceased with the writing of the Revelation. And it's significant to note, as I mentioned earlier, that in Paul's pastoral epistles, where he gives detailed instructions to church leaders, nothing is said of prophecy or of prophesying. It is all the word of God. Guard the word, proclaim the word, preach the word, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and understanding. It all comes down to God's fulfilled prophetic word. And that was toward the end of Paul's life. And there was a lot of scripture at that point that was accepted in the apostolic community. There was more to be added of John, of course, because Paul died before the end of the first century. John wrote in the 90s. So he was toward the very end of that first century. So the role of proclaiming God's revelation, which is contained exclusively in his word, is now fulfilled by pastors and teachers. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4 and elsewhere. That's why I say to you, please don't ever come to me or to one another saying God told me something unless you come with your Bible open and you're pointing to a, a portion of Scripture or unless you're citing from Scripture. This is God's revelation. I personally hold to that doctrine. This church holds to that doctrine. Again, if you have any questions that you want to discuss with me, I will be glad to do that. Now, coming back to our text with all of that as a background, because we're seeing prophets here and prophecy in this passage. Follow along, please, as I read Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. I'll stop in a couple of places uh, to show you a couple of maps and some other things as we go along. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 21. When we had parted from them, remember he's leaving now to go toward Jerusalem, he being Paul and also Luke and others, as we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran straight course to Kos, and next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. 
when we came to in, when we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload cargo. Now I refer you to the map on the back of your bulletin, not on the back of the bulletin, but the bulletin insert, the outline of the sermon. I just want to point out a couple of things. Geographically, this is, this is where we are. They're at Miletus. This is where Paul met with the elders. Now, the little island of Kos, they're passing Kos. They're coming to Rhodes, and they spent a day there, and then on to Patara. And from there, this is the map that's on the back of your thing. From there, from Patara, past Cyprus to Tyre, uh, Ptolemaeus, Caesarea, and then finally to Jerusalem. So this is the final leg of Paul's third missionary journey. So that's what we're dealing with geographically. I wanted you to be able to picture that in your own minds. Now Luke continues. This is chapter 21 of Acts, verse 4. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they, return, and they returned home again. In verse 7, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses, and we were staying there for some days, and a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we all... We as well as the local residents began begging Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, The will of the Lord be done. That's our passage. I want to just break it down by way of outline and go through it very briefly. Beginning with the journey to Tyre, back to verse 1. When we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran straight course to Kaz and the next day to Rhodes. You've seen that on the map, but you haven't seen this. Rhodes was the location of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Do you remember what it is? Yeah, the Colossus of Rhodes. This is an artist's rendering it's reported that the island of Rhodes had about 3,000 statues, but the Colossus of Rhodes was its masterpiece. It was a huge bronze statue, about 98 and a half feet tall, or 30 meters. It portrayed Helios, the Greek sun god. It took 12 years to build that statue, and it was destroyed almost instantly by an earthquake in 226 B.C. So by the time Paul and his companions docked at um, at Rhodes, uh, only the rubble would have been left. But continuing on now, verses 1 and 2, and from there to Patara, and having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, he went aboard and set sail. We went aboard and set sail. Phoenicia is not noted on your map, but it is the eastern portion of the Mediterranean Sea, right along the coast, and Tyre is in Phoenicia. That's on your map. So that's the general area, and that's where they were heading. Verse 3, when we came in sight of the island of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. That brings us to the warnings at Tyre. Verse 4, the warnings at Tyre. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Paul would not have known these disciples. He had never been to Tyre on his missionary journeys. So they literally looked them up, got them together, and the Spirit had revealed to them, probably through a prophet, of, of a local prophet, 
that Paul was going to face persecution. There's a question about whether or not Paul disobeyed the Lord at this point. And I don't want to spend time explaining it. I have a number of verses here, but I'm not going to do that just for the sake of time. Paul did not disobey the Holy Spirit by going on to Jerusalem. Paul never disobeyed God. And Jesus himself, in fact, Paul says that the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus is the ministry that he pursued, and that is the ministry to Jerusalem. Jesus had personally commanded him to go there so the Holy Spirit wouldn't contradict. So anyway, um, after Paul got to Jerusalem, he declared, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. And he certainly couldn't have said that if he had deliberately, blatantly disobeyed the Lord. Anyway, commentators are divided on whether or not Paul disobeyed the Lord at this point. Um, He did not. Verses 5 and 6, when our days there were ended, We left and started on our journey while they all with wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home again. Which brings us now to the journey to Caesarea. This is now going to bring him into the area that um, is the coastline where he's headed. Verses 7 and 8. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, We arrived at Ptolemaeus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day, and on the next day we left and came to Caesarea, which now brings us to the warnings that he received at Caesarea. And please note that the Holy Spirit warns him all along the way, but never prohibits him from going there. And this just tells us, and and that's why I subtitled this, When Godly Determination Rejects Personal Safety. Paul was um, determined, more than determined. He was going to go where the Lord told him to go, and he was going to complete his mission. The warnings at Caesarea. Now, Philip was their host, verses 8 and 9, entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. Uh, We stayed with him, and now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. You may recall in Acts chapter 6, Philip was a key figure in the early church. He was one of the seven men who were appointed by the apostles to help feed the the um, the Jewish well the the Jew, Hellenistic Jewish widows who were being overlooked in the serving of food and you remember after the day of Pentecost three thousand plus people were added to the church they had a mega church in one day and so they had to orchestrate all of that and to feed the widows and to take care of the people and so on and there arose a, a problem and so. They appointed seven men. We sometimes call them the first deacons. They were more than that. But anyway, he was one of them. So that's where we were first introduced to Philip. In Acts chapter 8, it was Philip who was sent to Samaria. This is after the the persecution that that Saul, Paul, had, had caused in Jerusalem. Philip went to Samaria, and he ministered there, and that led to what we call the Samaritan Pentecost. Samaritans. Jews who had intermarried and were hated by the Jewish establishment received the Holy Spirit the same way the Jewish apostles and disciples did on the day of Pentecost. That was a remarkable situation, and God used Philip to minister there first. And then from there, he was instructed by an angel of the Lord to go down to Gaza, where he met an Ethiopian eunuch and explained Isaiah to him, and baptized him because he became a believer. So Philip is a key figure. Now he is at Caesarea hosting Paul and his companions. We know nothing more about Philip's daughters, but as I said before, they were prophetesses, which meant they were godly women. They were gifted by the Holy Spirit to minister in a prophetic capacity. We just don't know the extent of that. Now, Agabus arrives. Verse 10, as we were staying there uh, for some days, the prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. We first met Agabus, as I mentioned earlier, back in Acts chapter 11, when some prophets from Jerusalem came to Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas were ministering at the time. And at that point, Agabus prophesied that there was going to be a great famine all over the world. And so Paul and Barnabas and the churches got together to take collections to help those especially the saints in Jerusalem who needed assistance. 
but that was prophesied through Agabus. Now he's going to present an object lesson to illustrate what awaits Paul in Jerusalem. So here's what he did, verse 11, Agabus' prophecy. Coming to us, he took Paul's belt, and Agabus bound his own hands and his own feet and said, and here's the prophecy, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Quite an object lesson. Now, why did God have him do that? It was effective. He could have just said, you know, you're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to be bound and so on. But he gave him an illustration. How did the disciples react to that? Verse 12, when we, Luke being with them, Luke having written the book of Acts, when we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, that's understandable. They loved him. You want to protect the people you love. However, Paul's reaction was quite different. Verse 13, when Paul answered, then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, throughout Paul's entire ministry, he lived in this tension between fruitful ministry and being with Jesus. And he expressed that from time to time, uh, most pointedly in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Listen to what he says. He says, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if, I'm on, if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. You see that tension? You, as a Christian, probably sense that tension too. Wouldn't it be far better to be with the Lord in heaven? And yet, as long as we're here, we have opportunities for fruitful ministries, for discipling our families, for, for ministering to the lost, for helping the, the gifts that the Lord has given to us. We, we can't minister those in heaven. They were given for the church and for the lost who are here. And so we live in that tension, maybe not to the degree that Paul did. I mean, we're not being beaten every day. We're not facing that level of persecution every day, but we're facing Satan's evil world system every day. And quite frankly, I'm tired of it. But that's not a resolu resolution to die. It's just a resolution. I, am, I will be very happy to be with the Lord. So to some degree, and that's the point, we live in that tension as well. Paul, even more so, magnified. So despite the impassioned pleas of his beloved companions, Paul, Paul's godly determination rejected personal safety, and he would not be deterred from going to Jerusalem. There was nothing they could say or do to stop him. So that brings us to our final decision, verse 14, or their final decision. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. And it was probably more like, the will of the Lord be done. This man is not listening to us. This man wants to face the fire. We can't stop him. God bless him. Go for it, Paul. Now, that's a very loose paraphrase, but... You understand, the will of the Lord be done. Now, by way of conclusion, Paul was a man who many might consider to have been reckless with his life, maybe even to have had a death wish. But the truth is that he understood very clearly the priorities in life. He understood very clearly what it meant to invest his life in the things of eternity. He weighed the options carefully and prayerfully so that he might fully accomplish the work that the Lord had entrusted to him. And consider this. Had he not gone to Jerusalem and then ultimately to Rome, we would not have most of the New Testament writings that are essential to our Christian lives and have been essential to the life of the church from the time they were written. Paul's imprisonments produced a good portion of of the New Testament is the point. Paul probably didn't know that his writings would survive thousands of years, but the Lord knew. The Lord knew what he was doing. And Paul knew what he wanted to do and what he needed to do. Paul needed 
knew he needed to go because the Lord had told him to go to Jerusalem. He knew he needed to be obedient and he wanted to be obedient to his calling. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, listen to what he wrote. He's talking about them, he's talking to them and about the priorities of his own ministry as his own ministry related to them. And he says in part, all things are for your sakes so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. That's the ultimate purpose, isn't it, of life itself, the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For, listen to this, what he calls his persecution, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's why his godly determination could and did reject all personal safety. In a sense, he threw caution not to the wind, but to the Holy Spirit and to the providence and the sovereignty of God in his life. We need to be in that model. Now, again, we don't face that kind of persecution, but we need to have the same mindset. God is in control. He's in control of our lives. He knows what we need, and he will give it to us. He knows what we don't need. He will withhold it from us. And so ours is to walk in faith. Ours is to walk in determination. Now, Paul knew precisely what he needed to do, where he needed to go, and, and the Spirit guided him along the way. Sometimes said, no, don't go there, and other times said, yeah, go there. And Paul was obedient. We don't have that kind of guidance, but we do have the same Holy Spirit. We do have the same Word of God. We do have the same principles, and we all have the same calling to glorify God by being obedient to Him and to His Word so that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the Lord will use us in whatever way um, he chooses. And, and we're all old enough to, to have seen that in our lives. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you, you can look back and see where the Lord has directed you providentially, sometimes very deliberately, and how he changed your life, how he brought people into your life, how he took people out of your lives, how he comforted you. You, you know, all of that, it's all orchestrated by a sovereign and a loving God. And so we, need, we do need to be tenacious in the spirit. We do need to be bold in the spirit. This world needs a bold witness. This city needs a bold witness. And we're being tested. And the flame hasn't been turned up really high yet, but it's being turned up higher. And that's going to help purge us, and that's going to help make us stronger, make us more like Christ who went through so much for us. You hear me say that a lot, but... Um, it's part of my responsibility and my desire to, to help equip us to face whatever the Lord has for us in the future. And then when it's time, he'll say, come home. And we'll go home. Maybe today, maybe in 20 years. You know, I'm looking at Kermit who says, boy, this is a good time to be 87 years old. It's a great time. <laughs> it's a good time to be any age. But uh, the Lord is our sufficiency. With that, please bow with me. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for the example that he set of tenacity, of deliberately um, sometimes walking into the furnace, knowing that he was going to be persecuted, knowing that he was going to be turned over to the Gentiles, in this case, knowing that he was going to be imprisoned and probably assuming that he would die. But thank you for what you produced through this man before you took him home. Thank you for the word of God that you produced through him by the Spirit. Thank you for how you used him. That gives us such hope that you will continue to use us as well. Maybe not to the degree that you used Paul, but all of us together um, have our part to play and our role to play in your kingdom. And we thank you for that calling and for that privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, please. We will sing one more song together, and it is hymn number 386. It is a wonderful song, one of my favorites. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. It's a wonderful hymn of dedication. It's like a concluding prayer to our service.
Jesus, we do love you. And we thank you for wearing that crown on your brow. And we thank you for conquering death. And we thank you for calling us this morning, those who love you, giving us a love, calling us into your kingdom. We want to serve you, please you, delight you in whatever time you give us. And uh, we look to the week ahead with our own plans, but knowing that you are sovereign and you have plans as well. Father and Lord Jesus, may we be faithful uh, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You invite you to join us downstairs for munchies. You are dismissed.